G'day everyone, and welcome to the latest in my series of law courses in two hours. This time, by popular demand, it's corporations law. In the next two hours, we're going to steam through an entire undergraduate corporations or company law course. Now, judging from the comments on YouTube, most people seem to properly understand the nature of these two hour videos. These videos are great as a primer before the term or for prep at the end of the term. They're also great if you're a business law student just dipping into legal study or if you're not a university student at all and you just love to learn stuff online. However, if you're a law student studying corporations law, this two hour video is not a substitute for a whole semester's work. The videos are good, but they're not that good. If you're new to these videos, you'll see along the bottom of the screen from time to time what are called authorities. These are either written laws or references to the cases from which we get whatever point of law I'm talking about in the video. Over time, I will develop two minute case notes for each of the cases. Let's see how we go at condensing an entire semester into the next two hours. Start the clock. The first thing we need to do is ask ourselves just what a corporation actually is and how it differs from other types of human institution. And the starting point for that is deceptively simple. Sometimes humans do things on their own and sometimes they combine together to do things collectively. And when they do things collectively, we need to understand how that collective grouping can work, how it can relate to other people, and how other people can relate to it. So for instance, if you go into a retail store to buy a clothing item, you'll be dealing with an individual person who's standing behind the counter. They'll help you try on the item, take your money or card and give you your new piece of clothing. But all of us understand that we're not really dealing with that person. We're not buying the item from them personally. We're buying the item from the store. And the individual human being that we are dealing with is just an employee of that store. So in that moment, we're making a contract, not with a person, but with this strange abstract thing called a company. At its heart, corporations law tells us everything the law needs to know about these companies, how they're formed, how they actually operate, their legal rights and obligations, and how they cease to operate if they're no longer required. All of this is corporations law. Now, a corporation is not the only way for two or more people to work together. For instance, two or more people might form a partnership where they remain as individuals, but they agree to cooperate and work together to share their efforts and rewards. In a partnership, individuals remain individual. The partnership itself is not a thing. It's just a word we use to describe two or more individuals working together. Similarly, there are organisations called unincorporated associations. These are often things like community groups or clubs where it's convenient for individual people to group together and cooperate, but those remain as individuals. The association itself, it's just a group of individuals. How then is a corporation different? A corporation is what we call a legal person. This idea takes some unpacking. Let's start with the idea of a natural person. We all recognize what a natural person is. A natural person is a human being. And under our laws, human beings have rights and obligations that simply don't accrue to other types of beings. For instance, we expect human beings to obey the law. We don't have the same expectation of dogs, cats, elephants, mosquitoes, meerkats, or butterflies. In the same way, the law provides human beings, natural persons, with a series of rights that other beings don't get. We have an inherent right to life, for instance. We have the right to own things. We have the right to enter into contracts. We have the right to commence proceedings in a court. Generations ago, however, the law came to realise that when people come together for a common purpose, under some circumstances, it may be appropriate for their common enterprise also to have some of the rights and responsibilities that attach to human beings. So, for instance, when individuals come together to form a company, 
it may make sense that to say that the company must obey the law and that the company can own goods and enter into contracts and commence legal proceedings. In other words, we say that the company can have most of the rights that a normal human being would have. We describe companies like this as being legal persons created by the law. Can you see the distinction? A natural person is created by nature. A legal person is created by the law. Every corporation is a legal person. A few things flow from this. The first and most fundamental is that a corporation is a separate legal entity from any of the people who are involved in the corporation. This is the classic legal principle that emerges from a famous case called Salomon and Salomon. Although for my money, the principle is actually easier to follow if you know a case called Macara and Northern Assurance. In that case, Macara sold all the timber that had been cut from his plantation and he sold it to a company that he owned. So he owned the company and the company owned the timber. He then personally took out an insurance policy on the timber that was destroyed by a fire. The insurance company refused to pay. They said, you don't own this timber. The company owns this timber. The court found that this was right. Macara owned the company, but the company was a separate legal person and it was the company, not Macara, that owned the wood. So a company has a completely separate legal identity, separate from those who own the company. A few things follow from this. First, if the corporation owns assets, those assets are not owned by any person with an ownership interest in the corporation. There's a distinction between those things that are owned by the corporation and those things that are owned by its members. In the same way, if the corporation has debts, those debts are not debts for which an individual member can be responsible. Those debts are owed by the corporation. Third, a corporation can make contracts with its members. So for instance, I might own a company, but then I might also have an employment contract with that company. So the company employs me and pays me a wage. This was exactly the situation that occurred in a case called Lee against Lee's Air Farming. Mr. Lee completely owned his crop dusting business, but he was also an employee of that business. When he died in a plane accident, his widow was entitled to his workers' compensation payout as an employee, even though he was also the company owner. The company had a contract with him, and that was perfectly valid. It follows, of course, that if the corporation breaches its contract, even a contract with a member, then it can be liable for damages. Finally, the corporation can be liable in tort, even to a member of the corporation. So in a case called Nickel against All Yacht Spas, the company was liable to Nickel for damage caused through the company's negligence, even though Nickel was also a director of the company. The most important characteristic arising from a corporation's separate legal identity is called perpetual succession. What this means is that a company might well exist for hundreds of years. And in that time, the ownership of the company might change many times. Shareholders will come and go. Directors will come and go. No matter how many of these changes occur, the company itself lives on. Hopefully, you got the picture by now. There's a distinction between the corporation and the people who own or hold shares or interests in the corporation. The corporation is its own separate legal entity. There are, of course, some limits arising from the nature of a legal person. For instance, a company can commit crimes, but a company can hardly be sent to prison or ordered to perform community service. It's difficult to imagine how a company could vote. In most states in Australia, a company can't be defamed, so a company can't sue for defamation. Fascinatingly, there's case law that says that a company can't be characterised as having a race, not even where the company's entire existence is to support the advancement of people of a particular race. The separate legal identity of a company is a crucial concept for a range of reasons, but the most important of those is what we call limited liability. 
What this means is that if you invest, say, $10,000 in a company, then your potential liability for the company is limited to the loss of that $10,000. So let's say the company ends up with a huge debt and goes bankrupt without being able to pay those debts. The creditors can't come after you personally. You'll lose your $10,000, but that's the limit of your liability. The debts owed by the company are separate to the debts owed by you personally. This allows people to manage commercial risks while still protecting their own legal possession. Now, some of you will no doubt be thinking that these are worrisome arrangements. I mean, are corporations necessarily a good thing if the result is that people potentially incur debts or other liabilities in a way that allows company owners to avoid their responsibilities? How's that okay? Well, much of corporations law, much of the material in this video, is fundamentally about regulating the conduct of corporations and the people operating them. And in most cases, this is the best approach to protecting people from abuse arising from the existence of corporations. At the same time, however, the law seldom likes its processes being used for evil purposes. And so it is with corporations law. Under the common law, the courts do have the right to do what Lord Denning poetically described as lifting the corporate veil to see what lies beneath. In other words, under certain limited exceptional circumstances, the court will look beyond the separate legal identity of a corporation and impose obligations on members of the firm. The two most common situations where this might happen is if the corporation is being used to perpetrate a sham or a fraud. The sham situation is best seen in a case called Gifford Motors and Horn. Gifford Motors sold both cars and car parts. Horn was hired as their managing director and his contract included a requirement that during his time with Gifford, he was not allowed to compete with Gifford or poach its customers. He got the sack and immediately commenced a new company which he owned. He initially called it E.B. Horn & Co, but then changed it to J.M. Horn & Co. Those were his wife's initials. Under that company name, he began selling Gifford parts to Gifford customers. When Gifford complained, he said, hang on, I'm not poaching your customers. The company J.M. Horn & Co is poaching your customers. Well, the court wasn't fooled. Lord Justice Handworth said, I hold that the company was a mere cloak or sham, a mere device for enabling Mr. Horn to continue to commit breaches of the clause. An example of a fraud can be seen in a case called Re Darby ex parte Broham, where Darby and another man, Guide, both of whom were undischarged bankrupts, formed a company so that they could engage in business activities without letting on to anyone else that they were bankrupt. They then secretly took cash out of the business before putting the company into liquidation. The whole scheme was a fraud, and so the courts refused to allow them to hide behind the company. However, it's very important not to overplay the prospect of lifting the corporate veil. In most circumstances, the courts will be extremely reluctant to take this step, in fact, courts have been so reluctant that it's genuinely difficult to identify any specific rules or precedents which would allow a lawyer to confidently predict that the corporate veil will be lifted. So what have we covered so far? We know that a corporation is a legal device to allow people to come together and cooperate for some purpose, usually for the purpose of generating trading profits. We know that once a corporation has been formed, it has a legal identity separate to those of its members. It's a separate legal person, which means that neither its assets nor its liabilities can be connected to its members. This means that members have the benefit of limited liability. Their only exposure to the debts of the corporation is the amount that they have invested in the corporation. However, we know that under limited circumstances, the court will be prepared to look beyond the corporate veil. Corporations can't be used as a vehicle for a fraud or as a sham. Before we move on to the next bit, though, a word about language. 
Sometimes in this video, you'll hear me use the word corporation. Other times, you'll hear me say company. You might find yourself wondering, what's the difference? Well, for the purposes of this video, there's really not much difference at all. So for the purpose of this video, you can pretty much assume that I'm using one word or the other just to make the teaching flow and not sound too repetitive. However, strictly speaking, they are slightly different concepts. The way to understand it is that all companies are corporations, but not all corporations are companies. A company is a type of corporation that's established under the Corporations Act and whose fundamental purpose is trading and making a profit. There are other types of corporation, sometimes referred to as bodies corporate, who might not have any intention at all of trading and making a profit. Charitable organisations, for instance. It's also worthwhile noting that not all businesses are going to be companies. Businesses might also be sole traders, they might be partnerships and so on. In this video though, the only sort of corporation and the only sort of business that we're going to discuss is the company. So sometimes you'll hear me say company, sometimes you'll hear me say corporation, and in the context of this video, it really doesn't matter. So now that we have a solid understanding of what a corporation is, let's step back in time a little. Those of you who've watched my previous videos will know that I always think it's important to have the historical context when you're looking at modern law. So how long have we had corporations? How have they been regulated in the past? And how do we regulate them now? Well, corporations by various names have existed for hundreds of years. They started out as essentially administrative bodies, allowing organisations like monasteries to hold and deal with property. Eventually, this provided a model for what we might call trading companies. These trading companies started due to one simple, awful fact. People die. And when people die, the law can get involved in unusual ways that might affect, for instance, what happens with the possessions that were owned by that person before they died. And so one way that developed to avoid this problem was to create a type of legal person who would not die, who could, at least in theory, live forever. That legal person, that corporation, could own the land or the money or the possessions and the shareholders can come and go, be born and die, buy in and buy out, all without affecting the ongoing life of the corporation. In the very earliest times, before the 16th century, corporations could only be created by a decree made by the king or the queen. From the 1600s onwards, corporations could also be created under statute. But these tended to be organisations created for some public purpose. For instance, a university might be created by a statute, and the statute would declare the university to be a body politic or a body corporate. It was some time later before corporations of this type started to be used for business purposes. Initially, when people came together to do business, they did it in the form of an unincorporated association, just a group of individuals. Later, they started to develop cooperative arrangements with one another through the devices of trusts and contracts. Those set out the obligations that they had to one another, but they didn't actually create a new legal entity. It took until the 19th century, first in the United States and then in the United Kingdom, for the law to allow the incorporation of corporations as a right simply by a group of people deciding that they wanted to form a company and following the rules of incorporation. When those rules emerged in England, they led to corporations law in each of the Australian colonies and general powers stayed with the colonies when they became states on federation. From federation until the 1960s, each state continued to manage its own system of corporations law. But as you can imagine, this became very inconvenient, especially for companies who were operating in more than one state or territory. Ultimately, from 1960 until 2001, the states and the Commonwealth worked together to try to harmonise their legislation to have a consistent scheme of corporations law throughout Australia. This worked well enough, 
sometimes better, sometimes worse, but well enough. By 2001, however, the Commonwealth and the states reached agreement for the states to refer their corporations' powers to the Commonwealth. As a result, the Commonwealth took on total control of corporations' law in Australia and it enacted two pieces of legislation, the Corporations Act 2001 and the ASIC Act, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission Act 2001. These are the key pieces of legislation that we are going to encounter during our exploration of corporations law. We are going to spend pretty much the rest of the next two hours looking in a little more detail at selected aspects of those two pieces of legislation. But it makes sense to start with something of an overview. Let's begin with the Corporations Act. The first thing to understand about the Corporations Act is that it is huge, like seriously huge. The only people who understand it all are people who spend really their entire careers working on corporations law. So any outline of the Corporations Act is necessarily going to miss out on a lot of the detail. With that in mind though, the Corporations Act does a number of important things. First, it sets out the rules for the incorporation or registration of a company. This includes the rules that people have to abide by when they're preparing to create a company, the rules that they must follow when they're attracting other potential investors or participants in the company, and the formation of the company's constitution. A company constitution, rather like a national constitution, sets out the basic structures and rules that anyone associated with the corporation must follow. Interestingly, when it comes to company constitutions, the Corporations Act also includes what are called replaceable rules. These are almost like a default set of important rules that automatically go into each company constitution unless the members of the company specifically make some other arrangement. So, for instance, Section 198 Capital A of the Corporations Act says that the business of a company is managed by or under the direction of directors who may exercise all the powers of the company. This is a replaceable rule, so companies can make some other leadership arrangement if they want, but if they don't, the replaceable rule will be the default. Second, the Corporations Act sets out fundamental rules for the officers of each company, most significantly the directors, the managing director and the company secretary. The Act includes rules for how they're appointed, how they're paid, how they must conduct themselves in terms of running the enterprise, and even who's entitled to be an officer of the company, because certain conduct might result in a person being banned from being a company director. Third, the Corporations Act establishes rules for the relationship between a company and its shareholders or members. This includes the need for shareholders' meetings and the way in which those meetings must operate and make their decisions. Fourth, the Act establishes rules for corporations raising money. This doesn't mean money that the corporation raises by way of trading for a profit. We're talking here about money that's invested in the corporation, either by way of a person becoming a part owner of the company, by the purchase of shares in the company, or alternatively, money that the company raises by taking out long-term debts. These are called debentures. Where money is raised by the purchase of shares, the Corporations Act includes rules for the payment of dividends to the holders of those shares. Dividends are shares of the profits of the company. Fifth, the Act sets out a range of reporting mechanisms that the companies have to follow. These include annual financial reports, processes for having those reports audited by an external auditor, and standard systems of accounting. Sixth, the Act sets out specific rules for large-scale transactions in relation to companies. By this I mean company mergers, where two companies come together, but also company takeovers, where one company takes over another one and makes it a subsidiary, or in other words, a company owned by another company. Seventh, and I promise we're nearly done, the Act includes processes for ending the company. Because while the idea of a corporation is that it can have perpetual existence, it doesn't need to. If the members of a corporation decide to bring it to a close, they're entitled to do so. 
if a company becomes insolvent, that is, if it's unable to meet its debts in good order, then the company might be wound up. Trading while insolvent is an offence. A company that's unable to meet its debts might also be placed into external liquidation, that is, handed over to someone else to sell everything off and pay as much as possible to the company's creditors. Finally, the Corporations Act establishes government regulatory processes so that the government, having agreed to the establishment and regulation of corporations, can then regulate them to ensure that they operate within the law. The key regulator, but certainly not the only regulator, is the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, known as ASIC. It has its own piece of legislation, the ASIC Act 2001. It has a broad investigative role and ensures compliance with the Corporations Act by corporations and also by directors and others involved in the running of each corporation. Other agencies involved in regulating corporations include the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, which manages the competitive nature of markets, the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority, whose role is specifically to oversee the operations of corporations involved in things like banking, insurance and superannuation, the Takeovers Panel that regulates transactions that result in change of control of a corporation, the Foreign Investment Review Board, which, strangely enough, examines and regulates foreign investments in Australia with the intention of maximising foreign investment without sacrificing national interests. And last but not least, the Australian Securities Exchange, which is a corporation itself, but which retains responsibility for regulating trade in shares and other financial instruments. On top of all this, of course, there's still other laws and rules and agencies with much more specific functions regulating particular industries or particular economic activities. <laughs> It'd be impossible to go into all of these in a 200 hour video, let alone a two hour video. The rest of this video really breaks down those eight functions that I mentioned a few moments ago. We'll start by looking at how companies are formed, how they're registered and incorporated. We'll then look at the rules for the key offices such as directors, We'll look at the role and the rights of members of the corporation, including shareholders, and the ways in which companies can raise money through things like shares and debentures. We'll look at how processes such, take such as takeovers and mergers work. And then finally, we'll look at how corporations end. To wrap the video up, we'll circle back around to look at the regulators, and in particular ASIC, to see how the Australian corporate environment is regulated. Now there's one other final thing that we need to talk about before we get stuck into the main content, and that's the concept of fiduciary duty. This is a concept that we'll come across quite a few times in our exploration of corporations law. If you're doing a law degree and you've already studied equity law, then you'll already know what a fiduciary is. There are certain types of relationship that are characterized by a very high level of trust and responsibility. Where one person either voluntarily undertakes to look after a vulnerable person's interests or where they have that responsibility thrust upon them by law, they're in a fiduciary relationship. There's no defined list of fiduciary relationships, but there are certain categories of relationship where the law automatically presumes fiduciary characteristics. Lawyers have fiduciary duties towards their clients. Trustees have fiduciary duties towards the beneficiaries of the trust. Someone who holds a power of attorney for another person has a fiduciary duty towards that other person. In corporations law, a range of relationships are fiduciary in nature. For instance, we will learn that company directors have fiduciary duties towards the shareholders of a company. What's the result of having a fiduciary responsibility? Well, first and foremost, a fiduciary owes their loyalty to the other party. They must act in the interests of that other party, even above their own interests. They must not allow themselves to be in a conflict of interest where their interests might conflict with the interests of the other party. They must not obtain any benefit or profit arising from their fiduciary duty. In other words, a fiduciary must be selfless when acting in the interests of someone else. 
they are held to the highest of standards. And if they fall short of those standards, the law will impose firm responsibility. Without fiduciary duties, corporations law would be impossible. Because if people are combining their resources and their efforts for some joint enterprise, they literally must be able to trust one another. On then to the substantive topics. We're going to begin with the fundamental question of how companies may be formed. This story often actually begins prior to the formal incorporation of the company. Every corporation has its history story. Sometimes a corporation is formed for tactical reasons or to organise the business affairs of an enterprise. Sometimes a company is formed because two or more entities want to come together for some mutually beneficial project. Sometimes, however, a company is formed because one person has an idea that they think will make a lot of money. And so they create a company and then go looking for investors who contribute money to the project in return for a share of the profits. If you think about it then, it's very likely that a certain amount of work related to the company is likely to occur before the company itself is even formed. Anyone who's involved in this process, the process of preparing for incorporation, or the process of identifying potential investors, is called a promoter. The word promoter is not actually defined in the law. It's a general purpose term referring to anyone who is actively involved in the process of establishing a new company. Promoters have a fiduciary duty towards the company. So this is the first fiduciary duty we've come across. Promoters must act in the best interests of the new company that they're helping to form. That means acting in the best interests of any future shareholders or other members of the company. One of the curiosities of corporations law is that before a company even exists, it's capable of entering into contracts. Promoters might enter into contracts on behalf of a company in this way in order to secure things that the company needs in order to get underway, such as premises or vehicles or stock. Even more surprisingly, promoters can even enter into contracts themselves with the new company. This creates some real issues in relation to their fiduciary duties. How can they be placing the interests of the company first if they're also entering into a contract with that company? The answer is that if a promoter enters into a contract with the company, they must give full and frank disclosure of what they've done to an independent board of directors as soon as such a board exists. They have to be completely, totally honest about the nature of those contracts and the benefits they've obtained and, well, about everything else. Anything short of complete and scrupulous honesty will be insufficient. Once all of the pieces are in place and the company is ready to get started, the process of actually registering the company is surprisingly simple. To incorporate a company, an application must be lodged with the regulator, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, ASIC. The form requires the new company to provide a range of details, including its name, the names and addresses of the original shareholders or owners, which the legislation calls members, the names and addresses of the directors and the company secretary, the shareholding arrangements, the address where the company will undertake its business, and what is called the company's registered office, which is its formal location if ASIC or anyone else needs to provide it with legal documents. A company's registered office is often the office of its solicitor or its accountant. Once all of those details have been provided to ASIC, then the company is issued with an Australian company number, and the company exists permanently until it's shut down according to law. Now, if you think about it, even though the new company is an independent, separate legal entity, at its heart, the idea of a corporation is various different people coming together for some common purpose. And it makes sense that those people will need to have rules governing their relationships. For instance, how will they collectively make their decisions? How will they appoint leaders? How will business strategies be chosen? How will the company choose whether to issue dividends or whether to take on debts? The Corporations Act sets up two ways 
in which companies can structure their own internal rules. These are called a company constitution and also what are called replaceable rules. Section 134 of the Corporations Act says that the internal management of a company may be governed by either of these or by a combination of both. Let's start with constitutions. Now, many of you watching this video, but not all of you, will be law students. And so many of you will already be familiar with the idea of a national constitution that sets out the rules for a nation and how the nation is going to govern itself. It sets out the institutions of government, the key positions, the ways in which people are appointed to those positions, the rules that important people have to follow and how disputes are going to be resolved. Well, that's pretty much exactly what a corporate constitution does. A corporate constitution will typically set out some basic aspects of the company, such as its purpose and fundamental structure, the way in which shares in the company will be issued and transferred, the way in which meetings of the company are called, and the ways in which decisions are made at those meetings, the ways in which key officers, such as the directors and the company secretary, are appointed, and the powers that are given to them, the ways in which the company's records will be kept, particularly the company's financial records, and the ways in which the constitution itself can be amended, including, if necessary, the ways in which the constitution can be brought to an end and the company wound up. Now, Section 140 of the Corporations Act makes the company constitution a special type of contract. In fact, it's almost a stack of contracts. The constitution is a contract between the company and each member, so each shareholder. It's a contract between the company and the directors and the company secretary. And finally, it's a contract between each member and each other member. To break these down just a little, this means that if members of the company are given rights under the constitution, then those rights are enforceable as though they were obligations under a contract. So let's say a company contract entitled every member to vote on certain company issues. If a member was prevented from voting, they'd be entitled to sue the company to enforce that right. Next, there's a contract between the company and the directors or the company secretary. This pretty obviously makes sense. If the directors are appointed under the constitution and it sets out their duties, then clearly it's going to result in enforceable obligations each way. Finally, the contract is an agreement between the members of the corporation, but only in respect of their rights and duties under the constitution. So basically, the constitution forms almost a stack of agreements that are all enforceable because section 140 of the Corporations Act says so. Before we finish up with matters related to company constitutions, I want to talk briefly about replaceable rules. Basically, the Corporations Act takes a bunch of things that you'd expect to find in a company constitution, the sorts of things we were talking about just a few moments ago, and it sets in place default rules. You can find a whole list of them in section 141 of the Corporations Act. They call them replaceable rules because the way it works is that they are all automatically inserted into company constitutions as a matter of law unless the members of the corporation decide to replace the rule with something else. An example might make this clearer. The word quorum refers to the minimum number of members of a committee who have to be there and voting for the committee to make any decisions. Section 249 capital T of the Corporations Act establishes a replaceable rule that a quorum for a meeting of company members is two members. Now that's not many. But the rule is replaceable. A company might decide in its constitution to make a minimum of, say, 10 members or members holding a total of 30% of the shares of the company or any other rule they like. So the basic rule is two members, but that rule is replaceable. Companies can make another rule if they want. This way, the replaceable rule provides a basic underlying automatic structure for every corporation without reducing the ability of the members of the corporation to create whatever specific rules they want to govern their relationships with one another. So, now we have a corporation. It might have begun with promoters, 
where it might have begun with a group of people or business entities coming together to create a new legal person. That company has been registered and it either has a constitution setting out its basic arrangements or it's governed by the replaceable rules that serve as a default or some combination of both. Next, we're going to peek behind the corporate veil and start looking at the key officers who actually operate the corporation on a day-to-day -day basis, primarily the directors, the company secretary, and the chief officers. We'll start with the directors. Most people have heard, at least in general terms, of the concept of a board of directors. It's tempting to describe the board of directors as being the bosses of the company, but in some ways this is an unhelpful way to look at it because it's not at all uncommon to see situations where the directors are really not terribly involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the corporation at all. The way I prefer to describe directors is this. We know that a corporation is fundamentally a body created by its members, its shareholders. And we know that those shareholders are ultimately the ones who make decisions about what the corporation should do and how. Often, however, there are so many shareholders that trying to get them all in one place to have debates and take votes would be a logistical nightmare. Instead, the company appoints a board of directors and a chairman of that board to be the directing minds of the company between general meetings. You might think of the board of directors as being almost like a committee of the company members looking after the company on behalf of the whole group. There is a definition of director in section 9 of the Corporations Act, but it's a super unhelpful definition. It basically says that a director is either a properly appointed director or someone who's acting as a director. Thanks for that, Parliament. There are a number of different types of director. In fact, any company constitution can create any types of director that the company wants. However, there's a few customary types of director that you should know. First, there's the managing director. The managing director is also often the chief executive officer. There's a replaceable rule, section 198 capital C, that says every company should have a managing director. The managing director is the proper boss. They're responsible for the day-to-day -day leadership of the business of the company. Next, there are executive directors. These are also senior leaders of the company involved in the running of the company from day to day. They're usually in charge of running some aspect of the company. So you might, for instance, have a sales director or a compliance director or a marketing director or anything else really, depending on the precise business that the company is engaged in. These directors are employees of the company, paid a salary for their work, but they're also directors of the company. The alternative are what we call non-executive directors. Non-executive directors are not involved in the actual day-to-day -day running of the company. Often their only involvement in the company is to turn up to board meetings. Non-executive directors might be large shareholders in the company, there to keep an eye on their investments, but they might also be board members who are brought in simply because of their prestige or their experience or their ability to provide an independent perspective on the business of the board. Former Prime Ministers, for instance, tend to sit on a lot of boards. If we turn then to leadership positions, there's the Chairman or Chairing Director, who chairs the board and is in overall responsibility for the company. And in some circumstances, you'll find what's called a Governing Director. A Governing Director owns more than 50% of the shares in the company, so really the company belongs to them. Strangely enough, there's no actual qualification to be a company director. Anyone who has legal capacity can theoretically be a company director. And from one perspective, this makes sense. Anyone can help form a company. Anyone can be a member of a corporation, such as a shareholder. So it makes sense that anyone involved in the company should have the right to put their hand up to become a director. At the same time, though, being a company director is a huge responsibility. It comes with some very important duties that we're about to discuss. And so it'd be pretty daunting for anyone without substantial business knowledge or skills to become the director of a substantial company. 
As a result of this, the Australian Institute of Company Directors has been established as a professional body to educate and support company directors. They have a well-regarded course designed to give directors, or those aspiring to become directors, the necessary professional skills. But let's be clear, the course is not compulsory. There's no compulsory qualification for becoming a company director. Once you become a company director, you take on a range of responsibilities. There are quite a few of these, but they really are important, so we're going to go through them one by one. Bear with me. The duties come from two different places, from the common law and also from the statute, that is, from the Corporations Act. First and foremost, the relationship between a director and the company is a fiduciary relationship. We've already talked during this video about what it means to say that a relationship is a fiduciary relationship. Many of the common law duties, and indeed the statutory duties too, flow from the fiduciary nature of the relationship. The common law duties and the statutory duties tend to cover a lot of the same ground, so we're going to go through them together. The first duty is the duty to act with care and diligence as a company director. The statutory version of this duty is found in section 180 of the Corporations Act. It's an objective test, so it requires the director to act with care and diligence that a reasonable person would exercise as a director of the company in that company's circumstances. This means the duty is much greater in relation to a large, complex company where a director is full-time executive director, and the duty might be much smaller in relation to a small business where the directors might be quite naive in a business sense. The statutory duty is really the modern representation of the common law duty to act in the best interests of the company. It also includes another common law rule, the duty to be diligent and careful. The thing is, with this duty, the assessment of reasonableness can't be made with 2020 hindsight. Directors who are making decisions for a company are making decisions about what might happen in the future. A court considering those decisions will inevitably be looking at decisions in the past. Sometimes directors might well make decisions that genuinely look like good solid decisions but turn out to be disasters. This happens all the time. In 1962, two executives from a record studio called Decca Records were at the audition for a guitar band called The Beatles. They rejected them. Within months, The Beatles were signed on by EMI and went on to become the greatest, most influential, highest selling band in history. From our perspective now, not signing The Beatles seems insane. But to those executives making a marketing decision about where popular music was heading, the decision was an honest, diligent decision. It just happened to be wrong. So the rule is called the business judgment rule. If a person makes a sensible, rational business judgment, then they've met the duty to act with care and diligence, even if the decision turns out to be a disaster. The next duty is a duty to act in good faith. This basically means acting honestly and without any type of ulterior motive. We then break this basic requirement down into a number of more specific types of bad faith. But don't be fooled. The requirement for a director to act in good faith, honestly and for the benefit of the company, is a general requirement. A director can't do anything in bad faith. It's not just limited to the examples that we're about to go through. The usual authority for pretty much all the categories of bad faith is ASIC against Adler. It's fair to say that Mr Rodney Adler broke just about every rule of good faith in the book when he borrowed money from HIH, where he was a director, in order to use that money to purchase shares in HIH, drive up the share price, sell those shares and reap a big fat personal profit. Not cool. Let's look at some of the specific categories. First up, there is a duty not to obtain an improper advantage or benefit from the position of director. Be aware though that this only refers to improper advantages. There are obviously proper advantages to be had from being a director, or nobody would ever do it. 
So, for instance, there's no problem with directors being handsomely paid for their services. There's also no problem if directors make a decision that is clearly in the interests of the company, but has the side effect of providing them with a benefit. The touchstone here seems to be transparency. If benefits or conflicts are fully and properly declared by the director to the rest of the board, and the board as a whole continues to focus on the best interests of the company, there shouldn't be too many difficulties. Next, there is a related duty not to misuse information obtained in the course of one's duties as a director. So, for instance, if a director becomes privy to the trade secrets of the company, the director can't then go and use that information in order to advance the interests of some other company in which the director might have an interest. Similarly, the director can't use their inside knowledge of the company to engage in what's called insider trading. Insider trading is a high-profile issue, and it's worth looking at a little deeper. You can imagine, for instance, a company that's trading on the stock market. Imagine I'm a director of that company, and I know that the company is about to announce its profit for the year. I know that the market is expecting a solid profit, so the share price is high. I also know that the actual profit announcement is going to be quite disappointing, so the share price is likely to drop. I can sell 100,000 shares right now, wait a few days for the price to drop, and then buy those same 100,000 shares much more cheaply, keeping the profits for myself. Why? Because I had knowledge that wasn't available to the rest of the market. It was insider knowledge. I was insider trading. If insider trading was allowed, no one would ever invest in shares. The whole system would fall apart. So those are the key duties of good faith. Don't make improper profits and don't make improper use of information. Finally, there are a series of director's duties that really only kick into action when things start going wrong. These are really the director's duties to creditors and trading partners and to shareholders when the company is in difficulty. First, there is a rule against insolvent trading. A company is insolvent if it's unable to pay all of its debts when they become payable. Once a company reaches that point, the company must cease trading. It is not okay to continue trading in order to try and get out of debt because the result of that trading might be to put the company even further into difficulty. If a director allows a company to continue trading while insolvent, the director themselves may become personally liable for those debts. They might also be committing a criminal offence by trading while insolvent. Second, there is a duty not to engage in activity which might broadly be described as phoenixing. The phoenix was an ancient mythological creature, usually associated with Greek mythology, but it may actually have even earlier origins. The phoenix was a bird which, when it died, would burn up in flames before rising from the ashes of its former self, born again. In corporations law, phoenixing refers to a situation where the members of a dying corporation transfer the assets of that company to a new corporation, leaving the dying one without assets. So, for instance, let's say our company owns a building worth $1 million. The company is operating at a loss, though, and struggling to manage its debts. So we make a new company, Company B, and we sell the building to Company B for 10 bucks. The result would be that when the dying company became insolvent, there would be no assets available to pay its debts. The assets which should go to the creditors remain in the hands of the new Phoenix Corporation, which has risen from the ashes of the old company. Transactions of this type are called creditor-defeating dispositions, and they are both a breach of director's duties and potentially criminal. A liquidator can also seek an order undoing a creditor-defeating disposition and recovering those assets from wherever they were sent. One final thing about directors. Do you remember me saying a few minutes ago that there was no specific qualification to become a director, so theoretically anyone can become one? Well, that was accurate enough. But once a person is a director, they can actually be disqualified from becoming a director. 
which also disqualifies them from becoming a director anywhere else. This happens for three reasons. First, if a director commits offences which are criminal breaches of the Corporations Act, they will automatically be disqualified from being a director. Second, if a director becomes bankrupt, they will also be disqualified as a director. Finally, if a director fails in their duties as a director, but in a way that doesn't amount to a criminal offence, ASIC can still seek a court order disqualifying the person from being a director, sometimes for decades. So that's it for directors. Before we recap and move on though, there's one other type of company officer I want to talk about, and that's the company secretary. Now often in normal English, when we hear the word secretary, we think of a relatively junior member of staff, still often very important to the success of the business, but very much in a support role. A company secretary, however, is quite a different use of the word. The role of the company secretary, in general terms, is to ensure the company's compliance with all of the major reports and other crucial documents required by the Corporations Act. These are set out in Section 188 of the Act. The company secretary is also often a director, but they have this specific responsibility, and there are penalties if they don't comply. Okay, so where are we at right now? Well, we've learned what a corporation actually is and how it has its own legal identity quite separate from the identity of the persons who are members. We know that the corporation is actually a special type of person, essentially an immortal person without a normal lifespan. We know that a corporation begins its life with promoters who gather members and then form their corporation by registration with ASIC. They agree to a constitution or the operation of replaceable rules in the Corporations Act, or both, and those set out the rules for the operation of the corporation. We know that the corporation is led by its officers, who are generally known as directors, including the managing director, the executive directors, the non-executive directors, and the company secretary. And we know that those directors have a fiduciary responsibility to the company, but they also have statutory responsibilities. Failing to meet those responsibilities can mean civil penalties, criminal penalties, and a disqualification from continuing to be a director. In the next section of the video, we're going to look at the roles and the rights of members of the corporation, by which we generally mean shareholders. We'll look at the relationship between the corporation itself, its leadership group, and its members. We'll look at the ways in which companies can raise money by selling shares to those shareholders, and we'll move on from that to looking at the other way in which a corporation can raise money by taking on debt, usually through the issue of what are called debentures, which are really just a fancy type of IOU. Ready? Let's go. We're going to do this by tracking a pretend company, which I'm going to call Dad Jokes Anonymous Proprietary Limited. Dad Jokes Anonymous was a private company incorporated in Australia under the corporation's law. It was created when a group of 10 comedians gifted in the ways of the dad joke came together to form the world's premier dad joke entertainment enterprise, focusing on online video and on dad joke merchandise. So we have this group of 10 comedians, they've got an idea for a joint business, they've registered the business, a corporation exists. At this point, without any more information, we'd assume that all 10 participants are on an equal footing. They get together for their first meeting and they elect, at least temporarily, three directors. The chairman of directors begins the meeting by asking, what did the sink tell the toilet? Everyone answers, you look flushed, and they roll around laughing at their own hilarity. Eventually, though, they're going to realise that to bring their unique comedy stylings to the world, they're going to need money. Because their corporation exists, it has a constitution, it now has a board of directors and a company secretary, but without money, it can't actually do anything. And so jointly, they decide that to get the company off the ground, they're going to need $50,000 in startup capital. How are they going to raise this $50,000? Well, one way might be for one member to step forward and supply all the money. But then, if that dad has supplied all the money, 
why should he only get one vote in the meetings of the company? Another option might be to say, right, there's 10 of us, let's put in $5,000 each. But what if some of the members, some of the most hilarious dad joke tellers, can't come up with $5,000? Or if they want to be involved, but not to the tune of $5,000? To get around these issues, our comedians decide that they're going to create 1,000 shares in the company. Each share will cost $50, and so by selling all of them, they'll raise their $50,000. So they're going to divide the company into 1,000 bits, and then each comedian can choose to buy as many or as few as their resources permit. One might buy 200 shares for $10,000. Another might buy only 10 shares for $500. If the 10 of them don't collectively buy all 1,000 shares, they might go looking for other people to buy the rest. Eventually, we have a group of members of the company, all of whom own different numbers of shares. To make things simpler, we're now going to look at just two of those members, the ones I just mentioned. One of them bought 200 shares, the other bought only 10. Now let's say the members of the corporation as a group have to make a decision. It'd hardly be fair for the member who's paid $500 for 10 shares to have the same voice as the member who's paid $10,000 for 200 shares. Similarly, at the end of the year, after a successful year of selling dad joke merch, when the profits came to be divided up, it wouldn't be fair if the member who paid $500 for 10 shares got the same share of the profits as the member who paid 10 grand for 200 shares. You can see where this is going. Every member gets one vote in meetings for each share, and every member gets a portion of the profits based on the number of shares they hold. Shares make it fair. So fundamentally, a share is exactly what it sounds like. It represents ownership of a tiny portion of the company, along with a bunch of other people. It allows the company to raise money. If the members want to or need to, they can then raise additional money by releasing more shares, although this means that the current owners end up, obviously, owning a smaller proportion of the company. Finally, depending on the constitutional arrangements of the company, the shares can be transferred. So someone who no longer wants to be part of the business, they might sell their shares to someone else. Stock exchanges exist to facilitate the buying and selling of millions upon millions of shares in different companies every day of the week. The final interesting thing about shares is that if they're bought and sold, they change value. So going back to our dad joke company, when it's formed, when the members pay their $50 a share, Nobody really knows how it's going to perform. Let's say two years later, though, the company has proven spectacularly successful. It's making massive profits, and the members are all getting rich. You can see at that point, someone who wants to become a member of the company might well be prepared to pay more than $50 for a share. They might pay $100 or more. Alternatively, if the company was doing poorly, if it was losing money and nobody was laughing at the jokes, then maybe nobody would really want to be a member of the corporation. So people who are, And people who are currently members, they might want to get out. And so they might sell their shares for much less than $50. They might sell them for $10. Who knows, for 10 cents. So the value of a share in the company, and therefore the overall value of the company itself, fluctuates, it moves, it changes, according to investors' perceptions of its value. Once a person becomes a shareholder or a member of a corporation, they become entitled to a range of rights in relation to the corporation. Some of those rights come from the common law and some of those rights come from the Corporations Act. First up, members of a corporation have the right to receive information from the corporation about its performance, its financial position and its governance. Specifically, this includes the right to inspect the company register, which is the list of people who are members of the company, and the right to receive a copy of the company's annual report, and the right to receive information about meetings of the members of the company. However, those rights are also limited in important ways. Even though a shareholder is a part owner of the company, that doesn't give them any sort of 
proprietary right or any sort of ownership of any of the assets of the company. Remember, those things belong to the company, which is a separate legal entity, and the company belongs to its members. Once a member has received information from the company, and indeed at any other time they like, or at any time required by the company constitution, the member has the right to participate in company meetings and to vote at company meetings. Again though, this right is limited. Shareholders don't have the right to jump in and interfere with the day-to-day -day running of the company. That has to be left to the directors and the managers. Publicly traded companies are required to hold an annual general meeting each year. However, regular meetings may also be required by the company constitution. And also, under Section 249 Capital D of the Corporations Act, a meeting known as an extraordinary general meeting can be called either by the company directors or by the members themselves. If members holding 5% of the votes in a company or 100 members regardless of the size of their holding call for an extraordinary general meeting, then the meeting must be held. What all of this means ideally is that shareholders, members, can be part of the corporation but mostly leave the running of the corporation to the directors who will then provide them with information. But if the shareholders become unhappy, they can call an extraordinary general meeting to deal with those issues. One of the key powers of members at meetings is to remove directors from office. So if the directors aren't performing, they can at least, theoretically, be replaced. However, all of this does leave the shareholders in the position where they are in some ways at the mercy of the directors, particularly small shareholders who don't have much practical capacity to influence the voting in company meetings. Once the shareholders own their shares, that's often pretty much the end of their influence. This can make them particularly vulnerable to exploitation by much larger shareholders who might insist that the company make decisions in their interest, in the interest of the large shareholders, even when those decisions might not be in the interests of all shareholders. The classic example of this was a case more than 100 years ago called Cook and Deeks, where two majority shareholders tried to gain the exclusive benefit of a lucrative contract rather than sharing that benefit with all shareholders. They weren't allowed to get away with it. Modern corporations law has provided a couple of processes for the protection of small shareholders. Two in particular. First, the Corporations Act allows the court to make orders in relation to the conduct of a company's affairs in the event that a company takes decisions that are unfairly prejudicial to or unfairly discriminatory against a member or members. So members and other people who have been members can take action against the company itself if they are subject to this type of conduct. And the Corporations Act permits them to do so by way of what is called a class action, where there might be many plaintiffs sharing the costs, but only one or a few formal plaintiffs who step forward as representatives of the entire class. There are now many examples of shareholders uniting to engage in class actions when corporations take decisions that they consider to have been improper. Most of these tend to settle out of court, often for substantial sums of money in the shareholders' favour. So that's about as far as we're going to go in this video in relation to shareholders and shares. Companies raise money by selling shares and everyone who buys a share becomes a part owner of the company. They become entitled to information about the company, they become entitled to vote in the company's meetings, and they become entitled to a share of the profits if the company is successful. There is, however, another way that companies can raise money, and this is by issuing what are called debentures or bonds. I said earlier that a debenture is pretty much a fancy IOU, and that's true. So let's go back to our dad joke company. The company needs to raise more money because we've decided to open a new comedy club in the middle of the city. It's going to be all dad jokes all the time. And so we'd need to raise $250,000. Now one way we could do this would be by issuing more shares. If we issued another 5,000 shares at $50 each, the same as the first ones, 
well then we'd raise the $250,000. The problem is if we did that, we would dilute or reduce the ownership level of the current owners. There would be more shares and therefore more owners and therefore any profits would have to be split more ways. That's not necessarily attractive. And so instead, option B is to say, okay, we're going to issue 250 debentures. Each of those will be worth $1,000 and they're going to last 10 years. At the end of every year, we will pay $4 interest on each debenture. And then at the end of the 10th year, we will pay that $4 interest and also pay back the $1,000. So if someone comes along and they've got $20,000 to invest in our company, we can borrow that $20,000 from them. We issue them with 20 debentures worth $1,000 each. At the end of the year, we pay them a total of $800 interest. And then at the end of the 10th year, we pay them the $800 for that final year, and we pay back the $20,000. This allows the company to raise additional money without diluting the ownership stake of the original owners. Anyone who holds one of these debentures is not a part owner of the company. They're merely a creditor, someone to whom the company owes money. They don't get to vote in company meetings. They don't get to share the profits. If the new comedy club is extraordinarily successful and makes millions of dollars, the debenture holder still only gets their $800 a year. However, if the comedy club barely scrapes by, the company still owes those debenture holders $800 at the end of the year. The Corporations Act in Chapter 2, Capital L, makes a series of rules for how debentures are raised and how they're issued. It requires the appointment of a trustee by the company. The trustee's job is to be a voice for the debenture holders, so even though they're not in the same position as shareholders, their interests are not disregarded. It also entitles the debenture holders and their trustee to obtain information about the performance of the company, and it entitles them to enforce any obligations that the company takes in relation to the debentures, for instance, the obligation to pay interest. So where does that bring us to? We now know that corporations have their own legal personality. We know they're formed when shareholders, also known as members, come together to form some common enterprise. They do this by registering their corporation and either by adopting a constitution or accepting the operation of replaceable rules. They often raise capital for the joint enterprise by selling shares, but they can also raise money by taking on debt, issuing debentures. Once the corporation is up and operating, its day-to-day -day activities are managed by its directors, particularly its executive directors. These directors are elected at meetings of the company membership. So the directors are essentially a committee of those members, charged with the responsibility of managing the corporation between meetings. We know that the members of the corporation are entitled to receive information about the company's performance and they're entitled to vote in company meetings on the basis of one vote per share. And finally, we know that there are measures in place to protect small shareholders from being taken advantage of by much bigger, better funded shareholders. The next bite we're going to take out of this topic is all about reporting and disclosure. Now, I usually try to make these videos a bit entertaining if I can, but I have to confess I have no idea how I'm going to do that for a section on financial reporting and disclosure. But what it lacks in excitement, it makes up for in importance. In fact, for anyone who ever invests in or deals with a corporation, this is probably the most important section of all. To explain why, I have to start with just a little bit of economic theory. I promise this won't hurt too much. A lot of economic theory revolves around the idea of markets. You can have markets for everything from apples and oranges to shares in companies to luxury cruise liners. The fundamental idea of markets is that they balance supply and demand. They ask, how much are people prepared to pay to buy this item? And also, how much are people willing to accept to sell this item? And if those two answers agree, then the sale occurs, or as the economists would say, the market clears. 
An example will help. Let's say I am selling a camera. Now new, it's worth $2,000, but I've owned it for a while and I've had a lot of fun with it and I know I'm not gonna get my 2,000 bucks back, but I'm happy to sell it for 1,200. You on the other hand are looking to buy a camera. You want a good one, but you're looking in the second hand market. You have $1,300 to spend. You can see that I'm prepared to accept $1,200 and you're prepared to pay $1,200, so the market would clear at $1,200. I'd take the money, you'd take the camera, and we'd both be happy. In an ideal world, all markets would operate like this, and economics would be a very easy thing to understand. In reality, however, economics is often more complicated due to a range of things which economists call market failures. These are things that affect the operation of the market, one of those market failures, the one that we are concentrating on, is called imperfect information. For a market to be operating perfectly in accordance with the theory, both parties would need to have a perfect understanding of the product they were trading in. That way they can both be setting their prices based on absolutely the same information. As soon as one party has more or better information, they get an advantage. For instance, let's return to that camera example. Now let's say I knew that this particular camera had been left for a couple of days in direct sunlight and heat, and that immediately after that happened, I noticed a rapid decrease in the endurance of the camera's batteries. If you knew that, you might no longer be prepared to pay $1,200 for that camera. If you knew that, you might only be prepared to pay, say, $900, or you might be prepared to pay the $1,200 on the condition that I replace the battery first. But if you don't know about the damage, you're gonna pay $1,200. You haven't been able to properly work out the camera's value. The market has failed. Now, what does all of this have to do with corporations law? Well, one of the biggest markets in the world is the market for shares. Billions of dollars are traded on shares every single day of the week fortunes are made and lost. But nobody would invest in shares at all if they couldn't get enough information about the companies and how they're performing. There would be an information failure and the entire market could fail. As a result, every corporation is under strict and strong reporting obligations. They have to inform the market about various aspects of the corporation's performance so that potential investors can decide whether shares in that corporation at that share price are a good deal. In addition, Chapter 6, Capital C, Capital A of the Corporations Act provides a parallel reporting regime for other corporations that are not traded on the stock market. What information are they required to provide then? Well, first and foremost, every company is required to produce an annual report. The heart of the annual report is the company's financial statements, which need to be prepared in accordance with set regulatory standards. The annual report also has to be independently audited, and so the report has to include a statement by the auditor to say that those financial statements are all correct. In addition, there must be produced half-yearly financial reports, midway between each annual report. The financial statements in the annual report are then accompanied by a range of other information. First, we have what are called the notes to the financial statements. These provide additional information necessary in order to contextualize the numbers in the financial statements and in order to explain how those numbers were arrived at if the financial statements themselves don't make that clear. Next, also along with the annual report, the company is required to produce a director's report. The director's report still includes quite a bit of financial information, but it's more financial information about how the company is constituted rather than information about how the company is performing. So the director's report will tell shareholders about dividends paid, it tells them about issued shares, shares that haven't yet been issued, where someone has been granted an option to buy shares, uh, and similar details that enable the shareholders in the company to have the full picture about their shareholding in the context of the company's overall shares. 
Uh, the director's report then also has to include a bunch of things that are not strictly financial reporting. So, for instance, the director's report includes a review of the company's operations for the year, reports on any significant changes to those operations or any significant events that have affected the company's operations, or which can be expected to affect company operations into the future. Essentially, the director's report is an annual opportunity for the members of the company to get a sense of how the company's performing and what its plans are. Now, there are, of course, limits to all of this. Director's reports are not confidential. Shareholders can show the reports to whoever they like. So it would hardly make sense for the company to tell the world all of its future strategies or current concerns. But as much as possible, the director's report is intended to, share, to help shareholders to understand where the company is at. A final type of reporting that I want to mention doesn't actually arise from the Corporations Act. Instead, it comes from the listing rules in the Australian Stock Exchange. And as such, it only affects companies listed on the exchange. The listing rules, as you might guess from the name, are the rules that a company must comply with in order to have their shares traded on the stock exchange. Listing Rule 3.1 says, once an entity is or becomes aware of any information concerning it that a reasonable person would expect to have a material effect on the price or value of the entity's securities, the entity must immediately tell the ASX that information. Now, there are exceptions to that which protect internal discussions and proposals with the company or trade secrets and that sort of thing. However, in general terms, if a company knows something or learns something that is materially going to affect its value on the stock exchange, the company has an obligation to report that matter to the exchange, which will then report it to all market participants. This means anyone who then buys shares in that company will have the chance to know about forthcoming things that might affect the company's value. Now, all of these reports that we've discussed really only relate to the financial performance of the company. However, since around the turn of the century, and especially since an influential parliamentary report in 2006, more and more companies have begun to recognise that while the company's primary responsibility is always going to be a financial responsibility to its members, corporations are also themselves members of the community. And so companies have begun grappling with non-financial responsibilities, such as social responsibility, environmental responsibility, responsibility towards local communities, and responsibility towards First Nations peoples. There is no specific legal requirement that each corporation must report on its social, cultural and economic impacts. And to be honest, it would be all but impossible to design a reporting mechanism that would be suitable for the infinite variety of corporate entities that might operate in Australia. However, the Australian Stock Exchange has a body called the ASX Corporate Governance Council. And it issues what are called its Corporate Governance Principles and Recommendations, many of which are focused on different aspects of social responsibility. For instance, Recommendation 1.5 suggests that listed corporations should have a diversity policy and regularly report on progress towards achieving diversity, particularly in terms of leadership. Recommendation 7.4 suggests that corporations identify their exposure to environmental or social risks and identify the strategies that they have to manage those risks. For many companies, environmental and social engagement might well be core business. It's difficult to imagine, for instance, a mining enterprise that tries to operate without environmental management policies or policies allowing it to effectively engage with local and First Nations communities. However, in many other cases, the impact is more subtle. Companies have certainly begun to realise the significance that many investors and also clients place on the company's environmental and social performance. This has certainly driven corporations to look for ways to modify their performance to meet those expectations. At the same time, however, this focus on environmental and social outcomes has sometimes led to accusations of greenwashing 
which means the preparation of glossy magazines or slick websites with happy families in communities surrounded by verdant greenery, but without much actual substance underneath. At the end of the day, though, it's important to keep in mind that the fundamental duty of directors is a fiduciary duty to look after the financial interests of the company's shareholders. Ideally, companies will look for and find solutions that make sense from a business perspective, but also make sense from a social or environmental perspective. During the COVID years, for instance, many businesses found new ways to allow staff to work from home, which reduced the cost and environmental harm associated with travel, but also opened up opportunities, for instance, to parents whose lives are complicated by the fact that the school day is so much shorter than the working day. In those situations, positive environmental and social performance also leads to positive business and financial outcomes. So here we are. At this point, we've talked about the nature of a corporation as a separate legal personality. We know that it's usually formed by members who are bound by their constitution or by the replaceable rules. We know they can raise money in a range of ways, most notably by issuing shares or borrowing, that is, issuing debentures. And we know that there's a range of reporting obligations that mean that current members and also potential future members of the corporation can learn about its performance. The focus inevitably is on the corporation's financial performance, but these days that's absolutely intertwined with the company's social and environmental performance. So the corporation is up and running. It's doing its thing. It's a legal person. But of course, that's a bit of a fiction. It's not a real person. It can't drink a beer or shake your hand. So how do we account for the differences between a corporate legal person and a natural person like you and me? I want to talk about how corporate legal personality works in three aspects of the law, in contract, in tort, and in the criminal law. Now, when I discuss each of these, I'm going to assume that you have a basic understanding of contract law, torts law, and criminal law. If you don't, then once you've finished this video, I've also got two hour law videos on this channel for each of those subjects. Let's start with contract law. Obviously, many companies exist in order to engage in trading activities. And even companies that don't exist in order to trade might still need to enter into contracts to purchase or sell assets or services or do any number of other things. There'd be no point at all having a company if the company couldn't enter into contracts or be responsible for meeting its obligations under those contracts. But the normal rules of contract formation don't really sit neatly for corporations, do they? I mean, normally, a contract is formed when there's an offer and then acceptance of that offer. And normally, acceptance is conveyed by spoken words or by conduct or perhaps most routinely of all by a signature. But a corporation can't do any of these things. A corporation has no voice. Only its members and directors who are human beings have voices. A corporation has no hands with which to sign a document. A corporation can't actually conduct any actions that might represent acceptance of a contract. For all these things, the corporation relies on an actual human being. Think about this. You're at a sporting goods store. You pick up an item you want to buy. You take it to the cash register and hand it over. That's your offer to buy the item from the sports store. But it's not the sports store that rings up the sale, takes your money and gives you the receipt. It's a person. For that moment, that person is acting on behalf of the company. So for a company to be involved in contracts, the company must almost always be represented by people. That, of course, leads to the really crucial question. How do you know? How can you be sure whether the person you're talking to, who seems to be talking on behalf of the company, how can you be sure if they're the real deal? If corporations have to operate through people, how can we tell for sure that we're dealing with the right people? For many years, it was mandatory for companies to have what was called a common seal. This was an official stamp that could be used to sign documents on behalf of the corporation. The Corporations Act still has rules for a common seal, but the stamp itself is not enough. 
For a common seal to be effective, it must be witnessed by either two directors or by one director and the company secretary. These days, however, contracts can also simply be signed by two directors or by one director and the company secretary without the need for the formal seal. More generally though, and more confusingly, a corporation's constitution can provide authority to contract to whomever the members choose. Any corporation can provide authority to anyone. But that takes us straight back to the basic question, how do we know? Well, there are three ways in which a person might have authority to enter into contracts on behalf of the corporation. The first is called actual authority. This occurs where the company has invested a particular person with the authority to act as an agent of the company. So if that person who has authority enters into a contract, well then the company has entered into the contract. The second one is more complicated. We call this ostensible authority. Ostensible authority occurs if someone doesn't actually have authority to contract on behalf of the company, but they're behaving in a way that would lead you to believe that they did have that authority. In an important case called Freeman and Lockyer against Buckhurst Park Properties, the court set out four rules for when ostensible authority exists. These rules are pretty tight. There is ostensible authority if, one, the company has acted in a way that suggests that the person had authority to enter into the contract, and two, that suggestion was made by people who did actually have the authority to enter into those contracts, and three, the party entering into the contract with the company relied on the suggestion. And four, there was nothing in the company's constitution prohibiting the company from entering into that contract. Well, as you can see, this still doesn't advance things very far. It's pretty unlikely that anyone entering into a contract with someone who seems to be acting on behalf of the company is going to meet all the requirements set out in Freeman and Lockyer against Buckhurst Park Properties. However, there is another rule which then comes into help. This rule is called the Indoor Management Rule, and it was developed more than 150 years ago in a case called Royal British Bank against Turquand. In that case, the court found that if a person is dealing with a company, and if they're doing so in good faith, then the person can assume that all of the company's internal processes have been properly followed. This means that when I turn up at the sporting goods store, I don't need to look up the company constitution and then try to work out the chain of command leading down to the checkout operator who's selling me my new tennis racket. The leading Australian case on the indoor management rule is called Northside Developments and the Registrar General. This case, together with an earlier British case called Morrison Canson, put some boundaries around the indoor management rule. Both of them really proceed from the requirement of good faith. First, if you actually know of any irregularities in the appointment of the person that you're dealing with on behalf of the company, then you can't just turn a blind eye to that and take advantage of the indoor management rule. Second, and perhaps this is slightly more complicated, you can't rely on the indoor management rule if there is something in the surrounding circumstances that really does put you on notice that you should be asking more questions. These rules are then expanded and reinforced in sections 128 and 129 of the Corporations Act, which sets out a range of assumptions that a person's entitled to make when they're dealing with a corporation. In summary, when dealing with a corporation, you're entitled to assume that the corporation's constitution is being complied with, you're entitled to assume that documents presented to you by an officer or an agent of the corporation are genuine, and you're entitled to assume that officers, agents and employees of the company are performing their duties for the corporation for a proper purpose. Similar to the common law though, you're not entitled to make these assumptions if you know they're not true, or if you know things that suggest to you that those assumptions can't be relied on and you need to investigate further. What does this mean for corporations and contract law? Well, it means that by and large, when an officer of a corporation enters into a contract with you on behalf of the corporation, you can assume that the contract is going to be binding on the corporation. 
You can therefore make contracts with the corporation in very much the same way as you would make a contract with an individual. So what about torts? Torts is actually a little bit complicated because obviously we can separate torts out into intentional torts, which require intention, and the unintentional tort of negligence, which requires a duty and the failure to meet that duty. So the real question is, can a corporation be said to form an intention? And can a corporation itself have a duty? The law answers this in two ways. First, there are certain people, in particular the executive directors who are really in charge of the corporation. Their mind is the directing mind of the corporation. Their will is the directing will of the corporation. In that situation, the law is prepared to say that the intention of the director and the intention of the corporation are one and the same. So if the director decides, say, that the corporation is going to intentionally occupy land without any entitlement, well then the corporation is held to have had that intention. And so the corporation itself would be responsible for the trespass. In many cases though, a corporation might cause harm to people without a director ever being involved. Consider, for instance, a classic slip and fall case. An employee in a shopping centre mops up a spill and then they realise they haven't got the warning sign with them. They disappear to get the warning sign and while they're gone, some poor shopper comes along, takes a tumble, breaks their hip. It's the sort of situation that makes us think the corporation probably ought to be liable, but it has nothing to do with a director in the central office or anyone else who might be considered a directing mind of the company. In this situation, the law says that the corporation is vicariously liable for the conduct of its employees. This comes from an old principle of English law that the master is liable for the wrongs of their servants. That English principle in turn was based on an even older principle of law from ancient Rome, where masters were responsible for the conduct of members of their household. And it makes sense. If a corporation must act through its people, then it makes sense for the corporation to be liable for the acts of those people. However, this only extends so far. First up, there's a general expectation that the employees will be following the company's rules and processes. If an employee completely ignores those rules, if they do what the case is called going off on a frolic of their own, well then they will be personally liable for any harm they cause. Vicarious liability in that situation won't extend to the corporation. Also in general terms, vicarious liability only arises from the conduct of actual employees and officers of the corporation. The law seems to be moving towards an extension of this to others who are in positions which are similar to employment, for instance, an unpaid volunteer. Vicarious liability does not generally arise from anything that a contractor does for the corporation. This makes sense from a number of perspectives. First up, a contractor is running their own business. They might even be their own separate corporation. They should have their own insurance arrangements. And so if they do something that causes harm to a person, well, they should be liable. Second, and perhaps more importantly, part of what makes someone a contractor is that they get to decide their own way of doing things. An employee gets told, do the job this way. A contractor just gets told, do the job. If they then choose a method that results in someone being harmed, well, it makes sense for them to bear the liability. So we know that you can generally contract with a corporation and enforce those contracts against the corporation. And we know that a corporation can be liable in tort, either directly because of the conduct of its controlling minds or vicariously through the conduct of its employees. Can a corporation be criminally liable? Can a corporation commit crimes? Now, fair warning, if you haven't ever been exposed even to basic criminal law, this next bit will be tough going. I'll do my best to explain it though. There are a couple of limitations on corporations when it comes to criminal law. The first and most significant relates to the concept of mens rea, or the guilty mind. It is fundamental to most criminal law that conduct can only be criminal if 
the person undertaking the conduct is doing so with the necessary state of mind. Usually this means having a certain intention. So for instance, if I accidentally pick up someone else's bag at the airport and take it away, I haven't stolen that bag because I never had the required state of mind. I never intended to deprive the true owner of their bag. So if state of mind is so critical to our concept of criminal liability, how can we apply this concept to corporations? Let's say that a corporation or a person connected with a corporation has done the acts which make up the offence. How can we consider whether those acts were done in circumstances that amount to the corporation itself having a guilty mind? Really, there are three ways this can happen. The first one we've already run into. Some people are sufficiently connected with the corporation that it's reasonable to consider that their will is the corporation's will and their mind is the corporation's mind. Two things follow. First, the court can take that individual officer's state of mind and, and attribute that to the corporation. Second, because of this, it's actually possible for the person, the individual person with the guilty mind, to be doubly liable. The corporation might be liable for the criminal act committed with their guilty mind, but they personally might also be liable for aiding and abetting the corporation to commit its criminal act. So that's one way for a corporation to have mens rea, a guilty mind. A director's state of mind can be attributed to the corporation. The second way is much simpler. There are various pieces of legislation that quite simply say that the state of mind of a director employee or agent of the corporation is taken to be the state of mind of the corporation. In legal terms, we say that the state of mind of the director, employee or agent is imputed to the corporation. An example is section 84 of the Competition and Consumer Act, which is part of the legislation intended to address a type of unlawful trading called cartel trading. Subsection 84.1 simply says that if a body corporate such as a corporation, is being prosecuted, then all that needs to be shown is that a director, an employee, or an agent held the relevant state of mind. Simple. Third and finally, there's another category of criminal offence called strict and absolute liability offences. These are offences where the prosecution doesn't need to show any particular state of mind. A simple example is a speeding offence. If you're driving and the car's speeding, you're liable, regardless of what your state of mind was. For those type of offences, there's no real problem. If the conduct can be attributed to the corporation, the corporation will be liable. Now, let's just imagine that a corporation is liable. If you stop and think about it, many of our usual criminal punishments don't really apply that well, do they? I mean, you can't send a corporation to jail. You can't make a corporation do community service or put it on a good behaviour bond. All you can really do with a corporation is to impose fines. However, even fines are complicated. Most fines are established at a level that's intended to deter or shape the conduct of individuals. But corporations, depending on their size, often have far, far greater financial resources. A fine that might be crippling for an individual person might barely be noticeable for a corporation. So the law has responded in the obvious way. Many offences that are punishable by fines include a maximum fine for individuals and another much larger maximum fine for a corporation. This enables the court to issue a fine at a level that will still sting and will leave the directors with some explaining to do when the shareholders start asking about all the money that's been used to pay the fine instead of being spread around as profits. So you can see that because corporations are legal persons, they can be liable in contract, in tort, and in the criminal law. However, because they're not natural persons with minds and with bodies, the nature of their liability is a little bit different. Okay, gosh, we've come a long way so far in this video. We've talked about the nature of a corporation. We talked about how a corporation's formed, the rights and responsibilities of its members and directors. We've talked about its constitution, replaceable rules, We've talked about raising money by selling shares and issuing debentures. We've talked about the various reporting requirements for corporations. 
And now we know how a corporation fits into contract law, torts and criminal law. We're starting to move further along the life cycle of a corporation now. Sometimes corporations, big or small, new or old, merge with other corporations. I guess if we're continuing the analogy between a corporation and a human being, we might suggest that a merger is something in the nature of a marriage. The members of two corporations might see strategic value in combining all of their resources to create one new larger corporation. The usual process for this happening is that the members of both companies will enter into what is called a deed of arrangement. The deed of arrangement will do things like set out the processes for members of each company to obtain shares in the new company, and the process for the transfer of assets, liabilities, staff, property, and so forth to the new company. It's an incredibly complicated process, and there are people who spend their entire careers just working in this area. For our purposes in this video, I just want to mention that Section 50 of the Competition and Consumer Act prohibits mergers that would substantially lessen competition in a market. So if there was a particular market for a particular type of goods and a merger was going to result in a company that would completely dominate that market, well, the merger would be unlawful. This obviously means that there is legal risk arising from a merger. Two companies might invest a great deal of time and effort putting together a merger, only to have it declared unlawful by the regulator, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC. To manage this risk, the ACCC allows companies proposing a merger to seek the ACCC's review of their merger proposal. This also involves obtaining public comments on the merger proposal. If the proposal is reviewed and approved, then obviously the companies can undertake their merger with a great deal more security. Once the merger has gone ahead though, you just simply have a new company. And it then goes about its business like any other company. The next step from mergers is an even more complicated process called a takeover. Remember the dad joke company I was talking about earlier in this video? Well, there were a thousand shares in that company. Now let's imagine there's another much bigger company out there. Let's call them the Family Entertainments Group. And they've decided that the dad joke company would be a good fit for their activities. And so they might start buying shares in the dad joke company. You can see that eventually they would have so many of the shares in the dad joke company that they would effectively own the company. This process, the process of buying up shares in a target company with the intention of controlling it, is called a takeover. Takeovers are heavily regulated by ASIC under the Corporations Act. The reason for this should be pretty obvious. There's a big chance that the interests of small shareholders won't be taken into account during the takeover process. And when you have a big company taking over, that might result in changes to the share price or distortions in the market that might disadvantage other participants in the market unless everything's done openly. So how are takeovers regulated? First, it's important to understand what actually counts as a takeover. There's a key threshold, 20%. As soon as you take steps to obtain more than 20% of a company, you're involved in a takeover. 20% might seem like a small number. After all, theoretically, you'd need 51% in order to dominate meetings. However, anyone with 20% of a company has a massive practical ability to influence that company. If a buyer wants to commence a takeover, there are three ways they can go about it. The first is called a creeping takeover. This happens where the buyer acquires their interest in the company on the normal market ever so slowly, just by buying shares. However, in order to avoid triggering the full takeover procedure, they're only allowed to acquire a maximum of 3% more of the company every six months. So you can see, starting from scratch, it'd take three and a half years to get to 20%. Everyone would have time to see what was happening, and there'd be no sharp shocks in the market. 
The second takeover method is called an off-market bid. The way this works is that the buyer has to make an offer to individual shareholders to buy their shares. The offer can be to buy the shares for cash or in return for some other instrument. So for instance, you can pay for shares with other shares. There are a bunch of technical rules about the price that has to be offered. The buyer has to prepare a statement setting out its offer, send it to ASIC and to the stock exchange and to the board of the target company. So there's no secrecy. Individual members of the target company can then decide whether or not they want to accept the offer. The various steps for making an off-market bid are set out in sections 632 and 633 of the Corporations Act. For our purpose, the key takeaways are that the offers are made directly to individual shareholders and that ASIC, the stock exchange and the target company all know what's going on. The final takeover method, surprise, surprise, is called an on-market bid. These are a lot more complicated. Section 616 of the Corporations Act sets out a lot of the differences between on-market and off-market takeover processes, and they're in a neat little table in Section 634. But let's try and simplify it a bit. The process essentially begins when the buyer makes an announcement to the market that they intend to make a takeover bid. Now, this might be something the two companies have been discussing in the background. It might not. It might be something the two parties have already more or less agreed to, and it might not. It might even be what's known as a hostile takeover, where the target company and its directors are bitterly opposed to the takeover. Either way, the takeover process itself begins when the buyer advises the market. Then the buyer makes a statement about its offer and provides that to ASIC and to the market and to the target company and to all of the members of the company. So far, the process is pretty similar to the off-market process. However, then the target company also gets to issue a statement to the market, to ASIC, to the buyers and to all of its members. The target company might encourage people not to accept the offer. They might say the offer is too low and encourage people to hold out for more. They might encourage people to accept the offer. There's sometimes two simultaneous takeover bids for one company, and the target company's statement might prefer one to the other. Either way, the shareholders now have advice from both sides, and they can decide whether to accept the offer or not. After that, the bidder can start buying shares in the normal way on the market from shareholders who've decided to accept the offer. At the end of that process, well, they will either have acquired enough shares to control the target company, or they won't have. Now, of course, there are extra rules, and they pretty much make sense. When a buyer is bidding for shares on the market, they're not allowed to sell shares in that company on the same market. So, for instance, if they acquire a bunch of shares and the price rises due to the takeover bid, they can't just sell those shares and cash in. Next, the buyer can't offer preferential treatment to some shareholders. Every shareholder gets offered the same deal. Finally, a person is not allowed to make misleading or deceptive statements about a takeover bid. And this includes making dummy bids, where the buyer isn't actually intending to take over the target, but rather is intending to have some other effect on the market. It also includes the company itself. For instance, if a company is a takeover target, well, they're not allowed to make misleading and deceptive comments that might encourage or discourage shareholders from accepting the offer. Once a takeover bid has been made on the market, it will be kept open for a minimum of one month and a maximum of 12 months. And at the end of that time, the buyer will have either obtained a 20% stake, in which case the bid has succeeded, or they will not have, in which case the bid is considered unsuccessful. But the buyer, of course, will still be a very substantial shareholder. Okay, now let's bring the life cycle of a corporation to its end. You might remember that one of the basic reasons for having corporations as legal persons is that unlike human beings, corporations can theoretically live forever. Indeed, there are some companies in some countries that are hundreds of years old. In reality, though, many corporations do in fact come to an end. A human ceases to live when their heart stops beating, 
For a corporation, it's slightly more complicated. Sometimes a corporation will come to an end simply because its members decide it's no longer needed. For instance, often when people are making a movie, they will create a company whose business it is to produce the movie. Once the movie is made, there might be no need for the company anymore and so it might be dissolved. Its assets will be disposed of, its debts will be paid. Any excess money in the kitty will be distributed to members of the corporation. This is accomplished by a special resolution of the members. That form of winding up is relatively uncontroversial. Sometimes, however, a company is wound up in much less happy circumstances. The key concept to begin with is a concept called insolvency. A company is solvent if it has the money to pay its debts as those debts fall due. A company may only trade while it is solvent. For the company's directors, allowing the company to trade if the company becomes insolvent is a serious breach of the Corporations Act. It can result in criminal penalties, particularly if the director is acting dishonestly. Once a company is insolvent, once it cannot pay its debts as they fall due, the company must cease trading and in that case one of four steps will follow. Those are called a scheme of arrangement, voluntary administration, receivership and winding up. I'm going to look at each of these very briefly now, but you need to clearly understand that this is a complicated area of law, even by the standards of corporations law, which is pretty complicated to begin with. In the few minutes that I have available, I'm really only going to brush the surface. Let's start with a scheme of arrangement. This is in some ways the most flexible arrangement. Essentially, the corporation that's in difficulties proposes an arrangement to its creditors to restructure its debt, and the creditors vote on that arrangement, and if they agree, well, the company can continue to trade. In an ideal sense, everyone would be a winner. The company gets to continue trading, and the creditors get to maximise the amount of the debt that actually gets paid. However, there are actually relatively few of these schemes put into effect. And the reason for this is that the court's approval of the scheme is required on two separate occasions, quite early in the process, and then again once the scheme has been approved. This means that a process that ought to be quite efficient and flexible becomes a lot more clunky. It's a pity. The second type of process is voluntary administration. This happens when the directors of the company, or a company liquidator, or a large creditor, appoint an external, independent person to administer the company. That person then has a relatively short time, only a month or so, but this can be extended by court order, and it often is. They have a short time in which to decide either to terminate the administration and allow the company to keep operating, or they can decide to liquidate the company, or they can decide to enter into what's called a deed of arrangement with creditors to enable the enterprise to continue operating in accordance with whatever the deed says. Possibly the best thing about voluntary administration is that once a company is placed into administration, a moratorium or freeze period commences. This means that once the company is placed into administration, or two weeks later for some types of creditors, nobody is allowed to make new legal claims or take any steps in relation to existing legal claims against the company. Essentially, everything gets frozen to give the administrator time to work out what to do. This can be a great opportunity for the company to pause and work out what comes next, without at the same time facing continual pressure from creditors chasing their money. If the administrator does not decide to liquidate the company, one way forward is to work with creditors to establish what's called a deed of company arrangement. This is basically a deal between the company and its creditors, where the creditors agree not to pursue the company for their debts, in return for certain changes being made in the company. Those changes vary, but they might include the sale of assets with the proceeds going to the creditors, or they might include rearrangement of the company's business operations or the installation of new directors or managers. It's really quite effective. And the best thing for the company is that only a majority of the creditors need to agree. As soon as there's a majority, 
the deed of arrangement goes into effect and it binds all creditors, even the ones who didn't agree. The third approach to an insolvent company is called receivership. Receivership is most commonly commenced by a large secured creditor. A secured creditor is a creditor whose debts are secured by collateral, such as a large asset. So a mortgage, for instance, is a commonly understood type of secured loan. Now that means that the secured creditors have a direct, immediate interest in certain assets of the company. And so if there's any threat to those assets as a result of the company's trading position, a receiver can be appointed in order to safeguard those assets. So unlike an administrator whose key focus is either allowing the business to operate or structuring the business in an orderly way for the protection of all creditors, the focus of a receiver is on controlling and usually selling assets for the benefit of that limited type of secured creditor. Receivers don't get the benefit of a moratorium. They can't enter into a deed of arrangement. Really, they want to get in, get the assets sold, and get out. Having said that, the receiver can't just get rid of the assets for any old price. Section 402 capital A of the Corporations Act says that the receiver is required to obtain the market value or the best price that is reasonably obtainable in the circumstances. The receiver then has to choose a sales method and go about the sale in a way that obtains the best price they reasonably can. The final method is called winding up. When the decision is made that a company is insolvent, one obvious solution is for the company to simply cease trading, turn all of the company's assets into cash, and then distribute that cash among the creditors as well as possible. This is essentially what happens when an insolvent company is wound up. When a company is insolvent, winding up generally occurs in two ways. The first is known as a creditor's voluntary winding up. Let's say a company is insolvent, it can't pay its debts. The company's members might vote to wind up the company. Or if the company is already in voluntary administration, the creditors might resolve to wind up the company rather than continuing to allow it to trade, potentially incurring further losses. The second way in which winding up might occur is by a court order. This often occurs once a creditor makes a specific type of demand called a statutory demand for the payment of the debt. If the company does not either pay or contest the demand, then 28 days later, the company will be deemed to be insolvent and the creditor who served the statutory demand will be able to apply to the court to have the company wound up. Once the decision is made to wind up a company, a liquidator is appointed. A liquidator is a bit different to an administrator. A liquidator isn't really interested in operating the company or making arrangements with creditors to restructure debts and allow the company to continue. By the time you've got a liquidator involved, it's all gone past that. The liquidator's job is to obtain the assets of the company, to liquidate those assets, which means turning them into money, and then to distribute those assets among the creditors. To relate it back to the death of an actual human being, the liquidator is much more like the executor of a person's will. Nothing's going to bring them back to life. The real question is how their stuff is distributed. And so that brings us neatly to the end of the life cycle of a corporation. We started out by looking at how corporations are formed, how they may have a constitution, replaceable rules, to allow members to come together and form an entirely new legal entity. We talked about the members and directors of that new entity. We talked about how the entity can raise funds either by issuing shares or issuing debentures and taking on debt. We talked about how, when it's functioning, the corporation can have rights and liabilities quite similar to those of an actual human being when it comes to contract law, tort law, or even criminal law. We've talked about how when a corporation makes profits, those profits get distributed back to the shareholders. And then finally, we've talked about various ways for a corporation to cease to exist. It might merge with another company. It might be subject to a takeover by another company. It might just be brought to an end by a decision of its members. And finally, it might become insolvent 
in which case it will likely be placed into administration and potentially wound up, which would bring the life of the corporation to an end. <laughs> it also almost brings this video to an end. There's just one last topic that I want to spend some time on, and that relates to the key institutions of corporations law in Australia. We've met some of these agencies along the way, but it's important for you to know that they exist and what they do. So I want to mention them separately. Now, I have to say yet again, this is not a comprehensive list, but hey, what do you expect in a two hour video, right? These are some of the key agencies that I reckon you should know a little about. I'll stick their website URL on the screen as I mention each. The first one, and by any real measure, the most important one is ASIC, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. They're established under their own act, the ASIC Act, but their general role is to regulate corporations law in Australia. Most of the time, if something in the Corporations Act requires the intervention of public servants, the job will fall to ASIC. Of relevance to us, ASIC is responsible for registering new corporations and for regulating their conduct. It carries out investigations of potential breaches of the corporation's laws, for instance, things like breaches of directors' duties. It regulates financial markets. It receives regular reports from corporations about their performance, and it's involved in regulating things like takeovers. It regulates people with special roles in the system, such as financial advisors and liquidators and administrators. Basically, if regulatory activity is required in relation to corporations law, it's most likely that ASIC will be responsible. ASIC is always the place to begin. Next, we have the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC. Now, the ACCC doesn't regulate corporations as such, but the work of the ACCC has such an impact on companies that it would be impossible to make this video without discussing the work of the ACCC. In general terms, the ACCC has three functions. First, they're responsible for safeguarding competition in Australia. Markets work best for the advantage of everyone when they're competitive and where everyone in the market is competing fairly. The ACCC regulates this, identifying, for instance, situations in which a merger might result in reduction of, the comp of competition in a market. Also, in circumstances where the nature of the market means that there really is always going to be limited competition, the ACCC has powers to stop those monopoly companies from just setting prices as high as they want. Second, the ACCC manages the Australian consumer law and they protect consumers. They can conduct representative actions on behalf of consumers who are ripped off and they can step in and stop ripoffs before consumers are affected. They can educate traders to ensure that traders are aware of consumers' rights. Finally, the ACCC has a role in managing large-scale infrastructure, such as power infrastructure, phone infrastructure, water, and so on, to ensure that competition in these very special markets happens in a way that benefits consumers and society as a whole. The third agency that we've met along the way in this video is the Australian Securities Exchange, the ASX, still often referred to as the Australian Stock Exchange. The reason for the use of the word securities is that while the focus is often on shares, there's actually a wide range of instruments traded on the exchange. The ASX operates the stock market, but as a result of this, it becomes a regulator, simply because if you want your securities to be listed on the ASX, you're going to have to comply with the ASX listing rules. And that includes a bunch of the rules we were talking about earlier regarding reports that need to be made to the market regarding anything affecting the trading conditions of a listed company. The fact that the ASX is central and strong and the fact that it op operates highly sophisticated and secure computer trade systems enables the modern and sophisticated and reliable flow of investment money into and away from publicly listed corporations. The next agency that I want to mention is the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority, or APRA. APRA's role relates to the major players in finance, so banks and similar deposit-taking institutions, insurance companies, superannuation companies. These are large institutions, often private institutions, but their functions are absolutely essential to the modern economy. 
It's impossible to imagine a modern economy without banks or insurance companies. Banks allow the movement of money around the economy. Without the banks, for instance, you'd never be able to use an FPOS machine or a banking app on your phone. But at a higher level, they allow for the movement of millions of dollars of investment capital around the economy to where it needs to be. It's also impossible to imagine a modern economy without insurers. Insurers allow individuals and corporations to manage risk by paying the insurer to accept some of that risk. Superannuation is not a major factor in every country, but in Australia in particular, it's now just about impossible to imagine an economy which didn't have major, major superannuation companies representing the retirement savings of millions of Australians and investing those retirement savings. Those investments allow Australians to have a secure retirement, but they also mean there are millions of dollars available for investment by experts to help develop the rest of the economy. All of this is so important that there just has to be a regulator watching out for the public interest. APRA is that regulator. Next, the Financial Reporting Council. These guys take the cake for having the most boring sounding title in the system, but their role is actually super important. Remember earlier in the video we were talking about the need for reporting systems? Companies have to report to their own members and they often have to report to the market and the whole purpose of all this reporting is to try to ensure that market activity is all properly informed. So information inefficiencies don't stop the market from functioning properly. Remember that bit? Well, obviously, none of that information is helpful at all unless it's reliable and consistent. Imagine if each separate company had its own individual way of measuring its accounting performance and its own individual way of reporting. You couldn't just look at the reports of a company and understand them. First, you'd have to learn about their personal system of accounting. It'd be really inefficient, quite chaotic. So the role of the Financial Reporting Council is to set the accounting standards that everyone else then has to follow. So a profit and loss report means the same thing for every company right across the system. The final agency that I want to discuss is called the Takeovers Panel. This is an expert agency made up of takeovers experts. They serve as umpires when there are disputes in the takeovers process. So under Section 657 capital A of the Corporations Act, they are allowed to determine whether unacceptable circumstances exist in relation to a takeover bid. And then they're allowed to issue what are called remedial orders to, us, to address whatever those unacceptable circumstances are. The definition of unacceptable circumstances is really broad and the steps that the takeovers panel can take in response to those unacceptable circumstances is also really broad. Essentially, they can step in at any time that a person with a sufficient interest in a takeover has their rights unfairly dealt with. Now, of course, these are not the only agencies that have a role in regulating corporations. There are literally dozens more, each performing their own special role in the overall scheme. But hey, this is a two-hour law course, not a two-week one. So here we are, at the end of our journey through corporations law. Wouldn't be much of a lecture if it didn't end with a recap, right? Let's quickly look, over, look back at what we've learned in the last two hours. We started with the very concept of what we mean by a corporation. A corporation is a way for people to come together and accomplish things they can't do on their own. But what makes a corporation different is that it has its own separate legal personality. It is a legal person, and its legal personality is completely separate from any of its members. In Australia, corporations are regulated by the Corporations Act 2001. It regulates corporations from before they're formed until after they've been wound up and ceased to operate. In the video, we've talked about the process of incorporation where the people who want to form corporations come together, register their corporation, and either establish a constitution for the corporation, or run it according to the replaceable rules, or some combination of both. We've talked about how corporations have members who are all the people signed up as part of the corporation, and they have directors who are elected by the members, essentially to run the corporation. There are specific officers, such as the company secretary, who have specific duties. 
We know that directors have fiduciary responsibilities towards the corporation and there are a series of directors' duties that they must comply with. Next, we looked at fundraising. Corporations often issue shares where a person contributes money in order to take an ownership stake in the corporation. Publicly listed companies might have hundreds of millions of shares. Smaller corporations might have just a handful. Each of those shares represents, as I say, a share of ownership of the corporation. They also represent the right to vote in company meetings in accordance with the number of shares held, and they represent an entitlement to a share of the company's profits in accordance with the number of shares held. Companies can also raise money by issuing debentures, which are fancy IOUs. Someone lends money to the company, and in return they become entitled to the payment of annual interest. And at the end of the term of the debenture, they're entitled to be repaid all of the money they loaned in the first place. So then, we have a company. It has members and directors. It has money from shares and money from debentures, and it's trading. We then looked at a few things that happen while the corporation is trading. For one thing, there must be regular meetings where the members of the corporation can make fundamental decisions, including the election of directors, and the corporation has to meet reporting requirements, providing information both to its members and more broadly to the market as a whole. We've learned that while corporations are operating, they're able to take on liabilities in contract law, in tort and in criminal law, but in each case, there needs to be some level of modification. Because after all, while a corporation is a legal person, it's not a natural person with arms and legs. We've learned that corporations which are operating sometimes merge with other corporations. And sometimes a merger might happen in a way that's not so much about two companies combining, but it's more like a little fish getting eaten by a bigger fish. We refer to these as takeovers, where an external player starts buying enough shares that they will end up with more than 20% of the total number of shares. And sometimes, sadly, corporations come to an end. This might be because they've achieved their purpose. More often it happens because a corporation has become insolvent. That means the corporation is no longer able to pay its debts in good order. When a corporation becomes insolvent, it must cease trading. And from that moment, everything is much more about looking after the interests of the creditors of the corporation rather than the interests of its members. Often with the help of an administrator or a liquidator, the company's affairs will be managed. Sometimes the company will come through it and keep trading. Sometimes the company will be wound up. The objective will be to seek the best possible outcome for the creditors. And only after the creditors are satisfied will any surplus amounts be distributed among the corporation's members. Now, we can stop the clock. In some ways, human history itself is the story of how people have learned to cooperate in more and more sophisticated ways. A corporation is part of that story. It is a way that people have developed to come together and accomplish things they can't accomplish on their own. Large corporations can have thousands upon thousands of members combining to amass billions of dollars which allow those corporations to create all of the goods and services that make up the modern world. Without corporations and without corporations law, we simply wouldn't have the modern world. I really hope that this video has helped you to start your learning journey in this fascinating area of law. See you again soon.